and um, i have checked the schedule and i've been uh, not able to actively participate but um, i've been following uh, the kind of topics which were covered and the experts which were uh, invited uh, i think it was fantastic lineup in in, in that sense so uh, what i will do today is just to summarize uh, you know few of the uh, let's say findings which we generally should take into consideration while uh, whenever or while we design for uh, uh, what we call uh, a sensitive landscape, uh, eco-sensitive zones and areas. And um, of course, uh, given my background of urban design, uh, I would like to uh, focus more and would like to lean towards uh, what we call um, you know, uh, ecologically sensitive areas uh, within urban zones. So uh, that is something which is of my interest and and i think i'll be add to uh, what experts uh, may have been saying uh, since last uh, five days uh, since you have been attending this program so uh, i will share my screen Yeah, generally what happens is that uh, it, it suddenly gets blank. Uh, that's the bug. So I hope uh, whenever it get, um, you know, uh, slide doesn't change. Anupama, do tell me. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, so uh, as part of the program, I thought I will speak on uh, various dimensions of placemaking. Uh, so uh, I'm not really going, going to give any <laughs> solution or, uh, or, or any kind of design specification as such, but uh, different kinds of dimensions which we should consider uh, while uh, making uh, an act of uh, or doing an act of uh, placemaking in eco-sensitive uh, zone and for me uh, given my background in urban design and my training in urban design uh, i will focus on uh, you know uh, sensitive zones which are uh, within the urban zones like i said and um, and then that's something which uh, all of us uh, all the time encounter uh, the kind of uh, sensitivity uh, which is uh, not really expressed by our uh, you know uh, administrators and those who are who are the real uh, decision takers as far as the city is concerned. So the idea here is uh, that if you as a landscape architect, you as an uh, uh, urban ecology student, uh, if aware of uh, the kind of dimensions which one should consider, uh, then one is able to look at uh, the kind of challenges which, which placemaking has as far as the eco-sensitive zones are concerned. So I will try to uh, place this whole problem of uh, placemaking uh, which uh, actually as a term looks little uh, superficial because placemaking in Indian context generally is considered as beautification. And, um, and, and that is something what we should avoid, uh, you know, putting it in the category of uh, beautification. Uh, many city authorities and municipal corporations who are doing projects under many heads, such as uh, smart city project, area-based development, and, you know, pan city uh, um, ideas, especially within the smart city, uh, you know, as a larger umbrella, uh, have been doing merely beautification. And many a time uh, we, we forget that uh, beauty may be the aspect of uh, design we, you do, but design ultimately has to be adaptive and, and fit into the context. And that's what brings me to uh, what we call, uh, you know, there are certain dimensions of ecological systems. Uh, and if, if we look at uh, surrounding us as an, you know, what we call as urban environment, um, we should look at environment as ecological system in itself. Uh, so it, it, it is not limited to merely uh, external objects and separating ourselves from those objects such as uh, rivers or water bodies or you know air or uh, tree what i see but rather uh, placing ourselves into this complex ecosystem which we uh, experience and which we are part of equally so the idea here is uh, to to look at this particular uh, setup uh, given by Amos Rappaport itself. So those who come from architecture background will uh, definitely uh, you know relate to this and can, can relate to this. Uh, so Rappaport, in his um, uh, numerous volumes which he wrote on environment as uh, human uh, system as human construct, um, has given these kinds of dimensions. So one is you know how do we perceive. Um, 
the second is how do we uh, express uh, so it has to have that uh, expressive nature uh, through which we learn and also pass on messages so a uh, three simple line of of uh, a few brush strokes uh, represents uh, kangaroo here and um, and and that's how we we make sense of our environment uh, the minimalism come into picture uh, and with minimum lines we are able to you know represent what we are thinking uh, perceptual is you know how we how we present and how we uh, you know uh, uh, express few things uh, through line uh, and and act of perception many a time depends upon uh, what we see merely with the eye uh, and uh, and sometime uh, the cognitive aspect that is uh, vision connected with uh, brain and thinking um, many a time doesn't come into picture so it's only the eye which sometime the visual sometime which dominate our our, our perceptions many a time uh, then certainly aesthetics values uh, which which we all know are important and critical and core of what we call uh, you know architecture and and planning and design uh, including landscape uh, architecture and design as well uh, it has to be adaptive and and all of us we adopt uh, in fact uh, given uh, the conditions which we are facing the environmental conditions which we are facing um, uh, to to which a lot of us uh, and and scientific world um, uh, has found out that it's the climate change which we are experiencing, um, uh, and and the general solution, uh, not exactly solution, but one of the approach which comes to uh, really looking at how do we survive uh, as far as the future is concerned, uh, and and how do we make sense of what is happening around us is uh, to become adaptive, uh, and adaptation of surrounding is something which we have been listening uh, you know since the time charles darwin came with his theories of uh, you know selection uh, by the nature of of a species uh, and and therefore uh, one which is adaptive uh, will will uh, survive uh, one which uh, adapts to surrounding conditions, one which which, which jails with surrounding condition uh, will survive and higher chance of survival. Uh, it has to be integrative. Uh, we all know and we, we keep on talking about this, but it's very difficult to uh, really satisfy uh, in terms of design requirement. But uh, we, we all of us uh, want our design to be integrative. Uh, and uh, not to forget uh, uh, design has no meaning if it is not instrumental uh, instrumental in bringing change uh, instrumental in um, uh, uh, igniting certain ideas and instrumental in uh, you know uh, uh, making uh, change as 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 constant part of the system so it has to be instrumental uh, instrumental in all aspects not only in design uh, but economical as the social uh, and and therefore a design which is uh, you know more or less uh, taking consideration of uh, these kinds of objective these kinds of uh, ultimate goals or you know uh, targets uh, uh, you know happens to be a quite successful design and that is what we try to generally learn from from uh, uh, from nature as well uh, so these are the typical characteristic of uh, nature and uh, which which does make sense that how they can also become design characteristics so so those are uh, very uh, important uh, the kind is uh, the thing is if you have gone through uh, the books and literature written by uh, you know uh, alvin toffler or or uh, fridge of capra uh, both are uh, with a scientific background and uh, known as futurists so alvin toffler's those uh, trilogy where he talks about how world has been changing and the future shock which is most known uh, literature wherein he talks about the world uh, of the future and the kind of uh, systems which will uh, uh, you know influence our way of thinking and life uh, and fridge of capra which talks about systematic view of the world uh, that how uh, we should perceive world as a system and uh, when we look at those kinds of uh, you know ways of thinking uh, what what makes us uh, really understand is the how can we reduce city models to to certain systems uh, that that becomes very important so whenever we are talking about intervening into ecologically sensitive zone we also uh, have to know uh, under what model 
uh, that city or that urban precinct uh, is uh, is is coming from so modeling is very important uh, and i'm sure modeling uh, uh, you know one can define uh, what kevin lynch did for uh, city and urban design discipline uh, he modeled uh, certain cities based on their character so he said uh, there are cities which are linear uh, there are cities which are concentric uh, there are cities which are uh, gridded there are cities which are amorphous and and don't have any specific form uh, there are cities which are um, uh, what we call distributive and and polycentric cities and not necessarily having only one dominant center so he gave us various kinds of model uh, uh, i mean to say that uh, he was the one who wrote about you know uh, taking this model from the science of geography and then uh, but putting them into urban design perspective so that was a major change so these models were there center place theory we all know is, is a primarily a geographic theory uh, which which is coming from the geography discipline wherein the center is very dominant and as you go away from the center uh, the land rates become cheaper um, the density becomes um, uh, you know scarce uh, and at the center you have everything happening so a cbd is situated um, uh, you know uh, lots of commercial activities happens the density of the people is high so these are the typical geographic models which then came into urban design and city design uh, and and urban planning and uh, there has been debate since then as how do we make sense of this model uh, do they give do they give us any kind of a, a you know template which we can follow uh, partially yes they do give linear cities have their own, own advantage uh, cities like mumbai or a state like kerala i mean not even a city a whole state like kerala uh, which is being linear uh, has uh, you know very distinct advantage that uh, much of the infrastructure can be laid out uh, very effectively and and very sustainably uh, just in case of mumbai uh, the way it evolved uh, with the railway lines uh, the linear uh, you know north south a movement then became the characteristic of uh, of, of mumbai uh, and the east west then became uh, you know uh, the uh, the cities where people live uh, and and it does make sense a linear city it reduces a, a city polycentric city like uh, new delhi uh, will have its own advantage uh, uh, you know the way metro rail will work there uh, the way subsidiaries uh, network of uh, metro rail which are now in the in, in the in the in the construction phase will ultimately connect to the central place so it will bring about a new layer of uh, structure as far as the city is concerned uh so why i'm explaining all this is because uh, unless and until we model our cities on certain aspect it's very difficult to make uh, relationship as far as this network is concerned so in order to understand the networking we need to model the cities so before i i, I go on and and establish this context uh, uh let me uh, play this video um uh, do tell me if, if if the sound is also uh you know uh, coming i will just start uh, are you able to hear the sound also sir no sir okay yeah so uh, seems to be just a minute can, can you send me the video so i will share it okay okay so i will do that so yeah uh, here is a share you can uh, post the link in the chat yeah, box yes yes that's what i'm doing so uh but uh, yeah tell me one thing if uh, if i share uh, so you will be able to share the volume as well the, the... yes yes sir yes okay, okay great is it audible yes you can Mumbai's make mumbai's ambitious coastal road project proposes to connect the southern part of the city with the northern suburbs along its western coast around 11 kilometers of the 34 kilometer long road will be built on 415 acres of land reclaimed from the sea an area equal to 113 1k day cricket stadiums the municipal corporation of greater mumbai which is implementing the project claims it will reduce vocs or vehicle operation costs travel times and environmental pollution citizens and experts however caution that it will do the opposite while irreversibly changing mumbai's natural coastline also at stake is the access to the seafront for mumbai citizens which will be replaced by a promenade and a highway 
But the people most affected by the project are the Kohli's, the native fishermen community of Mumbai, who have filed a petition in the Bombay High Court against the project. जगह हम लोग को अभी मच्छी पकड़ने के लिए मिलने वाला नहीं है और जो मच्छी का वो उधर बिल्डिंग है जो मच्छी का रहने का जगह है वो जगह अभी उधर से नस्त नाबूद होने वाला है अभी उधर मच्छी उधर रुकने वाला नहीं है Patil belongs to Varli Kolivada, one of the 23 active fishing villages in Mumbai, comprising more than 35,000 people in all. The original inhabitants of Mumbai, Kolis have customary rights to the coastal commons where they practice the centuries old artisanal fishing. Aur tabhi lobster itna nahi matlab milta hai. Ek ek jan ko kabhi kabhi 30000, 40000, 50000 aisa ek ek jan ko milta hai. इसलिए हम लोग इसको अप्रोच कर रहे कोस्टर रोड को जब भी उधर कोस्टर रोड बनेगा तो ये लॉफ्टर हम लोग को मिलेगा ही नहीं ऐसा जब क्वालिटी फिश मिलता है तो हर किसी कोई भी विरोध उसमें विरोध करेगा कि हम लोग का जो खेती है वही खेती ही नष्ट होने वाला है उधर से ओवर द डेकेड्स द एक्सपेंशन ऑफ मुंबई हैज कम एट द कॉस्ट ऑफ द कोलीज एंड अदर नेटिव्स हु हैव बीन पुश्ड टू द मार्जिंस देयर लैंड्स एनक्रोचड and their livelihoods threatened the kohli fisher folk are not opposed to the project itself but the reclamation of the shoreline which they claim will destroy the marine habitat bmc ne actually apne gaon mein jo machhwara society hai do ek varli nakwa aur ek sarode society usko approach us pe usne usse noc lena chahiye tha lekin usne ye kaam nahi kiya usne usko noc ki ki zarurat kyun hai ye ki ye noc से मछुआरे को एनओसी से ये सीआर जेड परमिशन के लिए इन्वायरमेंट डिपार्टमेंट जो अपना दिल्ली में उसको उससे वो परमिशन लेते थे लेकिन उसने चालाकी क्या किया उसने गांव की एक संस्था है जिसका ये मछुआरे या मच्छी के बिजनेस का कोई ताल्लुक नहीं उससे वो एनओसी लिया और वो एनओसी उसने सी आर परमिशन के लिए इन्वायरमेंट डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ न्यू दिल्ली को भेज दिया और एन लिया वो भी कंडीशनल वो उसने बहुत गलत काम किया और मछुआरे को फंसाया they also allege that the social impact assessment report had failed to consult with them hum yahan shivaji ke time se fishing ka business karke aur apna wo gadget mein 1970 1690 ko gadget mein udhar kohli samaj ka ullekh hai wo uske wo usko ek karke usne bypass karke usne hamare bare mein kidhar bhi ullekh nahi kiye hai lekin jab wo conclude karte hai apna report tabhi bolta hai ki machhwaro ka machhwaro ka कोली समाज का नाम नहीं लेते तो क्या मालूम है कोई समाज से क्या एलर्जी है बोलता है मछुआर का कुछ नुकसान होगा तो उसके बारे में आप कोई पॉलिसी रिपोर्ट बनाओ और तभी वो प्रोजेक्ट चालू करो लेकिन आप तीन महीने हो गए प्रोजेक्ट चालू हो गया उधर रिक्लूशन हो रहा है ना हमें कोई अपना पॉलिसी रिपोर्ट बताया ना हमें मीटिंग को बुलाया और आप हमें टोटली अंधेरे में रखा है वो बहुत बुरा किया है ऑन मार्च नाइनटीन The Bombay High Court reprimanded the state government for beginning the project without coming up with a rehabilitation plan for the fishing community. The same month, an independent report on the socio-ecological impacts of the project confirmed what the fisher folk had been fearing. So we are afraid that uh, because the breeding area is likely to be affected and also the inter tidal zone which also is a part of the food chain uh, we feel that the habitat of many of the different species uh, who are important for the food chain are likely to be affected and that will generally affect productivity of the coast as a whole besides a lot of the reclamation work that is happening is directly happening on the traditional fishing grounds of the fisher community where at present they cast their nets and the fishers have been forbidden for casting their nets the mcgm did not reply to our requests for an interview proponents of the project counter that a land starved city like mumbai cannot avoid reclamation projects especially considering that mumbai has been built over the centuries on land reclaimed from the sea but urban planning experts warn that reclamation can worsen the problem of flooding that mumbai experiences every monsoon Ironically it was the coastal road DPR's own environmental impact assessment study which says that um, you know one of the main causes for the 2005 floods in Bombay was the reclamation uh, for the Banda Kurla complex and if that wasn't uh, done the you know the destruction of the floods could have been much less so reclamation definitely 
is likely to have very serious impacts, not only to, uh, in terms of the destruction of the coastal ecology, but as well as the risk, in, you know, exacerbating the risk of flooding in the city. The coastal road envisions uh, large reclaimed open spaces, and then there will be um, a freeway, which is four plus four lane freeway, and then there is a promenade. Now, the expectation is that if you want to access the promenade, you have to pass through, um, go through an underpass uh, or an overbridge to reach the promenade. Um, there are examples of these kinds of uh, this kind of promenade which is in the Bandar reclamation. And if you see um, the way it is used, it's, the footfalls are very low as compared to, let's say, Carter Road, which is much closer to a residential area where people can walk across the road and access the promenade. And as for the fisher folk, the consequences of reclamation will be too close to home to ignore. Abhi, din pahile, ye jo reclamation kiya, abhi pani ka level itna bada hai. Yeah, so uh, the idea of a city model which I was talking about and uh, why I showed this video because uh, that is something which includes more or less, uh, sorry, that includes more or less the, uh, the kind of urban issues and ecological issues which we face as far as the sensitive ecological zones of cities are concerned almost in uh, all of our cities in India today. So Mumbai, of course, um, occupies a very uh, central position because being economic capital and uh, one of the great city uh, and, and uh, you know, also a lot uh, is at stake when it comes to Mumbai, uh, the density of the people and, and the kind of precariousness, uh, especially the marginalized communities are, are staying, uh, makes it a very focused kind of uh, uh, issue as far as the place of nature and ecology is concerned in our, in our cities. Uh, and uh, I would like you all to just remember the points which were said in the lecture and an important uh, point uh, uh, raised by the experts as well as the petition which was which was filed um, so here what we see is a typical post uh, modern city uh, model uh, on which most of our city ideas are based and the place of nature is based so if you look at you know there is this huge uh, first ring which is uh, known as urban region which is very big and and which includes uh, what we call the boundaries like metropolitan region or a major city or a walled city or density uh, high city wherein uh, there has been a prehistoric uh, or, or let's say you know in indian case of course it goes sometimes goes back to prehistoric uh, but uh, definitely the what we say pre-colonial kind of a city walled city medieval uh, city which existed and then uh, what we have is this uh, the satellite cities which exist, uh, outer satellite cities which are far away, peri-urban kind of a development uh, goes goes uh, uh, far away from the city boundaries, uh, devoid of services, devoid of any kind of a um, nature participation. Uh, then uh, definitely we have this. Uh, you know what classical era gave us uh, planning uh, modern era planning gave us the, the green belt uh, which all of us uh, uh, you know as planners uh, had put uh, when we were designing cities uh, back in uh, 40s late 40s and 50s uh, green belt became one of the important instrument as how do you control uh, the uh, the expanse of the urban area uh, and Definitely, in between what exists, uh, let's say this uh, metropolitan area and the major uh, and and the urban region, is the uh, green space mosaic, which is scattered with building, villages, town, cities, and there are uh, patches of forests uh, which exist, uh, and then there are uh, you know large patches uh, of of different ecological entities, uh, which has very high uh, di diversity. Sometimes uh, there are major corridors uh, of uh, water. Uh, as well as uh, nature and ecology. Uh, there are uh, narrow corridors of cropland, forest, uh, desert, 
uh, various kinds of uh, landscape uh, you know features which generally you as a landscape students uh, know in quite detail so what happens is that we have this idea where city is nesting in between a green uh, kind of a field and uh, generally we tend to separate that from where we live and and how do we operate uh, and and that's where the real problem starts as how do we uh, analyze the city and how do we look at the urban problem is that when we disassociate ourselves from uh, from the larger idea of a region uh, so if you look at uh, you know let's say if i cut a cross section through this diagram and uh, i try to see what is happening uh, or what is the uh, the status or state of uh, ecology as far as the center is concerned that is major city uh, then the metropolitan area which is a larger area around and and definitely the whole urban region if i cut a cross section it will give me uh, you know what we generally uh, expect or what we what is obvious seems to be obvious that the center will be heavily polluted and as we go away from uh, the metropolitan area uh, you will find that the level of pollution whether it's groundwater whether it's surface water or whether it's uh, the kind of air which we breathe uh, slowly becomes purer and purer uh, and 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 the idea is uh, here what why we are doing this is to understand that uh, somehow we have made this city model as as very sacrosanct where in the center of the city becomes important because it is economic capital uh, and it is a uh, central business district as we call it uh, which is uh, the term itself is uh, very exploitative in nature that uh, the only objective of having center is to extract as much as money possible from from that center through through urbanization uh, through rents uh, through selling of real estate uh, transactions of real estate uh, we tend to ignore that the region also is deeply affected uh, and vice versa uh, the region um, can also affect the city center and when we go forward uh, we tend to neglect uh, the city center uh, sorry the, the the urban region and and uh, the expansion then becomes the only solution as far as our urban areas are concerned and sprawl then slowly starts to occur uh, which further uh, damages the ecological networks which are there so here when we say eco sensitive zone uh, the, i would like to you know uh, define eco sensitive zone as not only those uh, zones which are declared as eco sensitive zone but also zones which has to do with the long term sustainability of our urban growth uh, and that includes water channels of all uh, category uh, whether primary secondary tertiary or you know uh, that includes the characteristic of green areas whether it's uh, uh, you know grassland whether it's different kinds of landscape barren mountains uh, all kinds of ecologies are important for for urban areas uh, and 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 for that matter diversity because uh, the only thing which will keep us going as far as the future is concerned is to respect the diversity uh, the moment we have uh, any kind of a strategy coming into picture where we want to flatten uh, the diversity it is going to uh, you know come back to us uh, with a with a huge vengeance and and we have seen that the way pandemic has uh, you know uh, struck us uh, so so any kind of a monopoly and any kind of a flattening uh, is going to damage us uh, thoroughly and therefore respecting diversity then becomes important so i will like I, I will i would like to refer the eco sensitive uh, zones in cities are not only the declared eco sensitive zone where you have uh, you know uh, rare trees and um, and 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 great uh, you know water bodies and protected forest but also those uh, channels of water network uh, also the diversity of landscapes as eco sensitive because any uh, plan uh, uh, you know and and any act of uh, development is going to destroy this diversity so we will have to take care that we don't destroy and and uh, really you know care about what we have coming back to the video again uh, and this is what the the real debate has been so the gap which you, which you see in between uh, that is a gap between anthroposphere and uh, the the geosphere or the biosphere uh, and you will find that uh, the kind of interaction which is happening between these two uh, you know the way we have separated till now and 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 we know that uh, you know even the climate change scientists have been saying uh, the way uh, anthro uh, 
anthropogenic activities uh, have destroyed uh, the climate and has been instrumental in destroying the climate uh, as uh, or or even the, the the kind of conditions which are saying around us um, the environmental conditions uh, it is through these instruments that we have been practicing and the particular kind of ideologies which are associated with these instruments so the politics is one the economics is one like i said uh, treating center of the city as as the place where only the economic should happen and and nothing else uh, it has place for uh, uh, this kind of a uh, you know the capitalist uh, thinking which we have uh, uh, as far as the economy is concerned uh, has created a huge impact on uh, on the eco sensitive uh, zones of the city where in the periphery is generally treated as as something which is a waste and and something which is uh, all the time available for development uh, that has been the typical capitalist city model uh, and urban planning had you know uh, adopted it since the history uh, the central place theory was was dominant in geography as well as in urban planning where in the center of the city is always a commercial operation and nothing else uh, then the administration and governance uh it it has much of its to do with uh, and the way uh, you know the association head fisherman association head was referring to uh, that you know how uh, there has been a system of loopholes which is made in order to bypass uh, the existing uh, legal mechanisms uh, and and wherever uh, there is a stringent legal mechanism it is then existed Uh, through through political mean so there is a relation between how politics is played and how the administrative and governance is is is, is then executed absolutely no civil participation uh, we we all know that and 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 that has been increasingly happening uh, all over the world recently uh, wherever there has been authoritative government uh, they have been completely ignoring the participation as per as of civil society is concerned uh, then certainly planning as an instrument how do we uh, generate this perception that uh, city is a place for living uh, is is something which we uh, need to all the time question and and cannot uh, we should not accept them as on their face value uh, demographics the kind of communities which are going to which are going to be affected uh, like in the in the video which we just saw it was a coli community and uh, and and like the head uh, of that association said uh, you know the way politically uh, and and the way the whole project has been conceived and the whole idea has been put forward uh, there has been the marginalization of that community uh, and its people Uh, so as not to include them as a primary stakeholder as far as the whole project is concerned uh, and merely reducing them to a, a beneficiary um, as far as the economic compensation is concerned so many a time the communities are uh, reduced to a group of people who are going to receive the compensation and a large term or long term Uh, social and cultural and economical changes uh, about that community uh, you know which project is going to you know destroy or or bring about a change in these communities uh, is not at all considered uh, and that's what we call anthroposphere in which all these activities happen so we have made certain customs on which our ideas of cities are based that is politics economics and then on the other side we have urban ecosystem uh, which has its very critical role uh, and, and 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 how we have been compromising that uh, through our instruments uh, so the idea here is to look at whenever you look at any city and and let's say what we call as eco sensitive zone uh, you should be also looking at uh, what are the different kinds of instruments through which uh, anthroposphere or you know uh, anthro uh, anthropocene to be to be specific has been um, influencing this thought process the way we take decisions about place of nature in our cities uh, and that's what brings me to a little more uh, you know inform chart wherein one can see that how uh, various kinds of ecologies and and uh, you know ecology of a city is uh, are connected 
so uh, if we talk about uh, city as an urban uh, mosaic which is composed of built masses and open spaces and uh, eco sensitive uh, you know spots and networks and it has some forms and function to follow uh, which are done through governance and land use we all know the way city is planned and operated uh, and then uh, why we do that uh, we do it in order to make the flow of resources happen uh, that is going from one place to the other like mumbai coastal expressway the video which you just saw is talking about the flow of resources from one part of the city to the other part and it says that the vehicle operation cost voc will be reduced uh, and that includes everything that includes pollution that includes the use of oil that includes the life of a vehicle which will be increased so given all these points uh, and, and the statistics is done and then it is uh, you know proven to to community and society at large that the project is beneficial but at the same time there are lots of after effect which are generally not expressed and and you know uh, thrown so what we have here is the flow of resources material information and people uh, which is given to us as as an advantage when such kinds of projects are executed so what we have here is uh, at the center the complex regional mosaics which are which are very uh, you know complex in nature then we have uh, diverse functions of a city uh, through planning act we need to diffuse them and then uh, we are talking about a network society wherein network is not only about information network but network is also about how physical connections are made that is the flow of resources and material uh, and so so whenever we talk about um, designing of a good Uh, urban model uh, we need to consider all these together at the same time we need to consider that all of them are interrelated so they are not something which is to be seen uh, only in terms of uh, you know fragmented kind of entities but rather very very connected uh, entities of uh, one of such eco sensitive zone or spot uh, which we all uh, can relate to Uh, and especially people from coastal cities uh, is certainly the crz now this is old map which was there uh, now uh, last year as as we are aware that uh, government has brought in substantial changes as far as the uh, the permitted depth is concerned uh, where the construction zone is allowed and it has reduced it to 50 meter so from 200 meter we have reduced it to 1/4 that is 50 meter which is called as no development zone until 50 meter you can build uh, earlier it was 200 meter still less but but as we know the history of crz if you go through uh, it is it is known as one of the most uh, Uh, uh you know uh, uh, changed uh, made laws and most of the abuse laws actually uh, by the democratic institution uh, itself wherein uh, as per the need of uh, the so called development uh, the boundaries have been constantly shifting as far as the allowance of uh, buildable zone is concerned uh and what we have seen the after effect like the experts notes down in the video is that the bandra kola reclamation which was done as an public uh, um, you know act of providing more land and converting into a great commercial district has been also partially responsible for the 2005 mumbai floods uh, so we have to understand that the old model of uh you know city development which primarily has to do with uh, looking at city only as economic engine are going to place us in trouble uh, in huge trouble so with economy we also have to see the ecology and that has been something uh, projected to the people uh, as anti development so so looking at ecology and environment in in the current development discourse is generally regarded as something which is anti development so placing ecology as against development or environment as against development has been one of the successful project which was taken up by you know uh, whether it's our political institutions whether it's our governments or whether it's our business and financial institutions they have been able to convey this wrong myth uh that uh, development and ecology doesn't go hand in hand uh and and that's where the real problem you know starts when we start dealing with the 
activities within ecologically sensitive areas and generally we tend to then project that uh, you know the development cannot come if you start declaring everything in the city as ecologically important uh, and therefore you will see a lot of reluctance by the government to declare certain patches and to declare certain uh, uh, important areas uh, as ecologically important areas. Uh, they, they, they will always be reluctant and hesitant to do it because it directly stops the development. That's how it, you know they project. Uh, and, and that's we all know it's a completely wrong thing. Uh, again, coming back to the modeling purpose, which which uh, we have been you know seeing, and and you can relate the Mumbai case as well. Uh, so here, what is uh, represented is the city is like a donut. That is, you know, the urban part is like a donut, and then uh, the line which you see constantly appearing in all the diagram is a river. The legend is shown on on top of the slide. You can see that. So there's a flood water from uh, tide. It could be a coastal storm. It could be a cyclone, hurricane, tsunami, salt water intrusion. So these are the kind of disasters which which may come in. And uh, the the hollow arrow, the arrow symbol is that of uh, river and waterfront from the uh, and and the flood water from the land. Uh, so uh, a city without a river like donut then uh, there is a slice donut wherein the city is uh, sorry the river is just cutting through uh, the diagram then there's a y slice donut wherein uh, there are tributaries of the river which are coming inside and to the city center and then flowing out then there is a half donut so cities like banaras uh, cities like um, uh, riverfront cities which are primarily co grown around the river only on the one side and not on the both side uh, then uh, indented slice half donuts wherein uh, you have it little bit shifted from from the from the edge of the river uh, and and you can also relate it to the coasts wherein the the no construction zone which we just saw in the crz uh, where you leave certain gap and then start constructing it uh, and then uh, there's an asymmetric slice flat flattened kind of a donut. Uh, so the idea here, and this is not something which is technical kind of a configuration, but uh, this will at least uh, put things in perspective, uh, wherein you can you can understand that how uh, you know the things can affect as far as the city and and its relationship with the uh, larger urban region is concerned. So when we say metropolitan area, that is the white portion around which the urban ring that the dotted thing is 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 there and slowly you can see the relationship the river which is coming through uh, whether it's cutting through across the urban region and uh, the, the the metropolitan area or whether it's through y shape or half shape donut we all see that uh, you know uh, that the river is coming from far away it's far across and it brings with it uh, the flood water from tides in case of uh, sea it's a coastal storms uh, there could be cyclone hurricanes they all are coming so in a way we are looking at relationship of the urban area uh, not in isolation we have to see its relationship with the larger urban region and that's what i call a, a very sensitive ecological spot uh, and not necessarily a land available for development uh, that is the general urban planning notion wherein we need to expand the cities but nobody is talking about how we can make the cities compact mm -hmm. so 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 we are always uh, talking about expansion and and that's where we are making thing worst so the moment you cover this dotted area uh, the texture uh, and go on expanding uh, you are going to increase not only the area of urban uh, the metropolitan uh, region but at the same time you are also going to put a lot of people uh, exposed to disasters which are going to struck uh, and, and the line which has been defined as a flood water from tide coastal storms and hurricanes and tsunamis which are going to come or the salt water intrusion which has been happening almost in all coastal cities of india uh, whether it's chennai or whether it's mumbai all have been experiencing a very high degree of salt uh, intrusion into uh, into the groundwater uh, so that makes this completely unsustainable so here we are uh, you know like uh, uh, what climate change scientists have been telling us that we have already crossed the point of no return in some cases uh, wherein we can't reclaim uh, some of the conditions uh, we can only now reduce the speed at which the destruction will happen and so so that's the worrying scene but but that's the reality that that's how and just one can relate to 
uh, various kinds of examples. So here uh, we have a, you know a diagram wherein uh, you see on top of the uh, hill, um, you know in, in the valleys. Uh, there is a uh, there are upper streams uh, there you will see a lot of visitation which is which is coming uh, and from there the river then flows uh, you know um, into the city uh, and you see at the left hand side bottom uh, there is a small lake a water body which is created around which there is a uh, a group of trees which are planted and the river is flowing from top of the hill it goes uh, and and then finally the it, it, it flows through so this three types of water bodies that is uh, you know the way it is upstreams are coming the way river and the lake so these three kinds of water bodies are typically connected to groundwater we all know that this is uh, equally important and and they have different uh, you know uh, duties to perform they have different uh, functions to perform uh, so water coming from upper stream uh, it, it, it has to be collected at some place through dam or through you know uh, you know putting a obstruction so that you can store so that you can retain uh, and then from the retention then you leave it to the river uh, you, the, the river has been then straightened if you put uh, let's say uh, you know, channelize it, uh, do concretization, which is another fascination now. Nowadays, we see uh, uh, in all our cities. Uh, then, uh, you know, you do a lot of construction nearby. It you build buildings. You uh, you uh, you know reduce the natural capacity of a river to to mitigate back uh, in in its flood plain. So you you also encroach upon its flood plains, uh, and wherever you see the danger, you increase the height of channelization or the concrete wall uh, and the idea is to reduce the river to a, a backyard almost by by you know uh, why backyard not because only with the sense of vision and and the visual permeability but also a, a ecological relationship of a of a city with the river and and that's where the problem uh, starts and we have been seeing this whether it's case of mumbai whether it's case of chennai uh, which is now seeing almost annually floods uh, every monsoon it, it goes into a problem uh, not only because it's a, it is definitely it's, a, it's it's something which is which is built uh, very near to the coastal edge uh, that is fine but at the same time the kind of networking uh, which chennai had uh, the network of water bodies and and other things uh, which existed prehistorically and and people have been respecting it and as the uh, the so-called development scenario came into picture. Uh, we could see that uh, all uh, was lost, uh, and and these water bodies were encroached upon and built upon, and and we see the floods uh, everywhere. So uh, these are the eco-sensitive spots actually. So I would like to define eco-sensitive spots not only those areas in the urban region, but also within cities. Uh, every stream is important, and and how do you manage it? Uh, so we don't have we don't have drainage maps of our cities. Uh, that's the one saddest thing. Thing, uh, uh, which we all know, uh, including a city like Bhopal, which which floods. Uh, uh, I mean, floods in the sense some part of the city do get do get uh, the flooding in in monsoon, and uh, there are uh, quite affluent residential colonies in these uh, areas, uh, which are which are built uh, right within the uh, within the within the flood. I, I won't say uh, flood. Uh, plain but, but uh, they are uh, built right within the um, the buffer zones of the streams uh, and and water tend to accumulate in in monsoon in these regions uh, so people invest a lot of money but at the same time what they are getting in the return is 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 residential uh, colonies uh, built in uh, the, the so called buffer zones and that's where the uh, the problem starts we don't have drainage mapping of the city so eco sensitive spots of the cities are actually the drainage map uh, which all of us uh, should have access to when we say all of us uh, i'm i'm talking about citizens uh, citizens generally don't have access generally regarded as you know very technical drawing so they may not be able to understand it uh, and what is done in master plan is a large level drawing which doesn't make any sense uh, but unless and until we map our streams in cities uh, and drainage channels in cities uh, as same scale as buildings, uh, it's not going to solve the problem. Uh, 
case of bhopal uh, again uh, those 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 who know uh, uh, the city can can understand uh, this this is a typical case a donut example if i take wherein uh, a city is engulfing from from around and then there is a lake which is trying to sort of you know sustain itself uh, i'm saying that because you know every master plan comes in uh, there is a, a, you know there are provisions made uh, to uh, really encircle the lake from from whatever side available for development uh, and that creates problem and that is uh, also a lack of understanding as far as the lake ecology is concerned and the kind of catchment it shares with the surrounding region uh, and today only there's a there's a news uh, in the newspaper that uh, the development plan of bhopal is being made without considering the the catchment authority a new authority which was supposed to be you know const you know constituted in order to take care of how uh, lake as an as an anchoring device for the city uh, can be imagined uh, but, you know the planning process which was followed till now uh, the eco sensitivity of the lake uh, it's it's considered uh, only from the city point of view and not necessarily lake as an uh, natural element within itself and how it need to sustain in its own way uh, i mean it's, it's not that we are all the time going to uh, use the lake as commodity to uh, to to make the land valuable uh, to to view it or to use it for the recreation purpose uh, those are definitely the ecosystem services which we uh, tend to exploit from from natural resources but at the same time we also respect uh, or should respect the, the the presence of lake in its own ecological uh, sense and realm uh, which is not happening uh, we all know this is one vihar which is again a, a, a quite a eco sensitive uh, spot and something which um, was identified back in 1983 before uh, that it was a stone quarry uh, the uh, there was excavation work which was going on as far as the stone is concerned and administrators at that time could realize that if this keeps on happening the upper lake will be in danger Uh, and uh, the one good thing they did uh, in 1983 is to get declared and notified this area as a national park uh, because then the control of the state government is reduced and the control the local control over this uh, region get reduced uh, and 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 then the only uh, party which can uh, you know do any kind of a change in land use any kind of change in function is a central government ministry of environment and that's how when we had uh, became then uh, a very important um, a landmark is declaration became very important landmark as far as the history of bhopal is concerned because then uh, the 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 sustenance of the lake uh, was ensured uh, as far as the drainage uh, is is concerned as far as the flow of water is is concerned uh, and and that's how what we see one we have today as an as an emerge uh, ecological spot right within the center of city is primarily because uh, uh, you know the vision which was uh, existed at that time is to is to have the national park at the at right at the center of the city uh, and also to save the lake so these are uh, interrelationships between various uh, ecological entities within city and i think that that matters a lot when one understands and respect these relationships uh, again i am talking this from the administrators point of view who were quite visionary in a sense that uh, they could get it declared as an as a national park uh, i'll just skip this slide because there's something the another example which is uh, you know how the eco sensitive spot has been uh, destroyed in in recent past as far as bhopal is concerned is this one of the tributary which uh, you know one of the uh, one can say the backwater or or, or the channel uh, as far as the upper lake is concerned uh, is the uh, you know the sair sapata area which was uh, designed as a uh, or which is designed as a recreational spot as far as city is concerned and and uh, bhopal being rich in its ecological uh, aspect um, sees these kinds of proposals coming up in every quarter of the city uh, so this was one uh, which got built uh, but then uh, it substantially uh, damage the habitat of uh, uh, you know birds uh, which used to uh, especially the migratory bird as well as even the local migratory as well as the international migratory uh, both uh, it ended up in destroying and this the, this was observation which was given by um, you know the local um, 
uh, bird watchers club uh, and and uh, that has been identified as something which is uh, is a damaging act wherein uh, not only it, it build this whole concrete thing uh, there but by inviting so many people in huge number uh, the whole uh, the tranquility of the area as far as the soundscape is concerned uh, got completely damaged uh, and therefore uh, repealing uh, any kind of a life as far as the bird is concerned uh, what severely affected so this is one step uh, uh, you know one wrong step uh, which which was taken by the city authority generally uh, you know uh, bird life is not considered as something which is uh, because of course they don't have any you know, advocacy book or they can't talk on their own aspect uh, so uh, so it's very easy to prove uh, and easy to intervene uh, and get the project done because there is hardly any party to 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 object to it apart from the environmentalist. Uh, but a lot of people forget that actually birds are the indicator of the city health, uh, and that has been realized through research and through uh, lots of activities that uh, which were done according to uh, how how bird life uh, symbolizes the city's health, is that. The kind of diverse bird you have, uh, you know, visiting to your city, uh, actually talks about the diversity of landscape of the city as well. So uh, we all know there are various categories of birds. So there are birds of prey. There are uh, there are birds which are primarily in the flood plains. There are birds which are primarily around the water bodies, and there are birds which lives in grassland, in bushes, or on higher trees, or in rocky outcrops. Uh, every bird has its own habitat. And the more diverse the city is uh, in terms of these habitats and landscape, the more diversity of the avian population you will have. Uh, and that's how uh, every city uh, you know, in, in developed countries uh, take birds as an indicator of their city's health. Uh, and somehow which we in Indian uh, cities have been forgetting about. Uh, so we all know that the kind of, uh, you know, uh, some species getting extinct uh, from city areas and we have now only visibility of more and more urban birds like pigeons and you know, crows and other kinds of things whereas the diversity in the bird population has been substantially reduced and has been observed in case of Bhopal as well the migratory birds which used to come till upper lake uh, in, in the months of February in the high winter month uh, are now stopping only at the Halalpura dam uh, or uh, you know, uh, lake, which are uh, which is quite away from 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 city center and and the uh, one vihar itself. So, uh, you know, so so the indication is there um, in in terms of how we have been uh, not considering the ecological uh, hotspots of the city um, as as also important for the city's image. So they they are not something only to be. Uh, use or exploited it as nat beautiful natural spots but they have their own right to be there uh, as far as the life of the other species is concerned so not everything in the city is for humans uh, there are lots of things which are which are there for other species as well and should be respected so the section which i was uh, just talking uh, at the beginning uh, as far as if you cut down through these um, you know the diagram which we saw um, uh, at the start of the lecture uh, one can you know uh, map uh, the level of uh, air water and plants as far as the pollution and the damage are done to it is concerned so uh, we know that the, the line which you see uh, I will just use the marker there yeah so the line which you see here is actually showing how the you know level of uh, these pollutions are concerned so more is the depth here like here more is the depth so it is showing at the, the heavy pollution and as you go away from the center the pollution uh, and and the other uh, you know so called uh, environmental uh, conditions get improved as you move away from the center on both side uh, whether it's this side or that side that's a typical city the center city. now this model has to change uh, and and we can't really uh, go on with this model forever. Uh, we have to really uh, now uh, think about the alternative models of development, wherein uh, the outside of the urban environment, uh, which we generally regard as very serene and very natural, has to come in and participate with the city. That is something which has been completely lacking as far as our understanding of the new city model is, is concerned. So landscape urbanism is definitely the, uh, the you know, the, the 
the approach to to look at wherein we can combine the disciplines of urban design and landscape architecture and design together and rather than thinking in separate silos and and separately we need to think together in terms of how we can look at cities as as, as uh, the construction of both of these disciplines and not necessarily only urban design and only landscape architecture uh typically uh, like i said the eco sensitive spots are also uh, the way we plan our uh, shorelines the way we plan like in case of mumbai uh, coastal expressway uh, the study has been done where it is going to affect even the fish catch which these fishermen are going to do and um, uh, the problems have been identified anyway fishermen have to go uh, deep uh, as far as the um, you know the length is concerned the nautical miles are concerned uh, but Uh, with the new construction coming in and the same thing is going to happen when it comes to uh, you know uh, the whole construction of coastal road happens uh, they will have to go deep into the sea to the catch the fish uh, because most of the fish will would have moved away uh, with the coming of noise and air pollution and not to mention the oil which will be leaking from uh, these vehicles uh, every vehicle uh, has the leakage problem whether it's new or old uh, there will be certain wastage which is going and and with the rainwater flow this oil is going to then enter into the sea so more and more road construction more and more pollution of the water body and and the aquatic life moving away from the pollution and going far away into the sea uh, and that will make even for the fishermen to really hunt uh and and catch the fishes so what you have here is is a typical remedy that to how water sensitive urbanism can can act uh, is to look at and understand the role of upland the network that is road and the shoreline so once you understand the dynamism between these three uh, one is able to uh, intervene a uh, little meaningfully and and trying to understand that the water in my site is not necessarily my water but the water in my site has to go you know to to someone uh, or the downstream or the shoreline where it you know, goes into the uh, lake or sea or river uh, and that's is, is something which is very critical for us to understand as a designer and as well as also as 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 citizen so here i'm ending my uh, uh, you know presentation uh, which was more or less revolving around uh how we are defining uh, you know the place of nature and uh, not necessarily the sensitive eco spots are those which are uh, rich in ecology and rich in diversity definitely they are but also we have to define redefine uh, the eco sensitive spots or, or zones in cities as something which is going to affect the the, the long term sustainability of our uh, life uh, and and our urban life uh, that is something which i would like to highlight so these are the few points which uh, you know all of us should uh, think about whenever we are talking about uh, planning for the future or even doing landscape design uh, with respect to uh, the urban conditions and and primarily working with the urban ecology as an environment uh, around which we need to respond because that is something which has been uh, challenging Uh, as far as the sustainability idea is concerned um, large level global climatic changes will definitely alter uh, the the natural ecosystem uh, you know cycles but at the same time uh, ecological cycles uh, and urban environment within cities uh, are going to uh, you know increase and multifold this phenomena at a greater speed and therefore uh, that will need also intervention apart from global uh, policy level changes it's also the uh, local level changes like they say uh, act local and and then of course you can uh, impact and you can make the impact at as far as you know at the global level so uh, that is something which i want to you know highlight again that the eco sensitive zone and its redefinition is needed so eco sensitive zone need not be always interpreted in uh, you know legal and uh, other kinds of standard definition but rather we need to bring about what is the eco sensitive zone in cities as 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 a different idea um, you know uh, which has to do with the um uh, respect of larger biodiversity within urban areas and and uh, how we deal with the act of uh, building cities uh, that is something which we need to all you know think about so yes that's where i will finish so if you have any questions uh, or any observations uh, do let me know so uh 
thank you so much sir for the insightful presentation which allowed us to understand urban morphology and uh, the urban processes uh, that also need to be kept in mind and uh, you had very uh, like carefully pointed out that need of program develop can arise from the uh, local by looking into local solution that it cannot be rigid or uh, homogeneous to all uh, regions and also like we, that was very useful when we have identified ultimately concluded with the objectives of life making in such regions uh, like for thinking of flood resilience climate modification and uh, aquatic habitat uh, conservation so the place making should necessarily take care of these larger goals exactly. so i request the, the participants to share any questions if they have Also, also add, yeah, also add to what has been said. So you can always, you know, uh, present a different viewpoint. So that is also uh, welcome. So I request the participants to kindly write their questions in the chat box so we can take them one. Are there any questions, guys? If anybody has any questions. I hope some of the parts were already covered in terms of, let's say, a major issue like climate change. Was that covered in the previous sessions? No, sir. We did not talk much about climatic aspects. Climate. But uh, yeah. so it was and especially the whole, uh, in the, you shared the urban morphology that helped them to understand the zonations between the urban core. So right now they have only looked into natural environment or water. Okay. So uh, this was very right. helpful. This would be very helpful in understanding mm -hmm. different, uh, yeah, different zones or uh, processes within. Them. Yeah, especially okay. those who will be working in, I mean, definitely everybody will be working in urban conditions, being landscape architect as well. Uh, that is something which we uh, need to, you know, uh, think while while designing because all urban environment, or urban ecology is now has become separate discipline altogether. Uh, earlier, it was only ecology as an as an you know standalone discipline which people used to study, but now urban ecology has emerged as a very critical discipline. Yes. Yeah, and we really need to address them to yes. mm. save recurring losses of our Lost, yeah. definitely i had a comment and a question uh, yeah yeah please go ahead. yeah uh, you know i was just uh, reflecting the mm -hmm. in, in our design profession we tend to compartmentalize our roles mm. as an architect as an urban planner as a landscape architect as an environmental planner uh, probably as a biologist or a zoologist, but at mm. some point, uh, nobody talks of team building and working in teams. Uh, even when projects are given in urban areas uh, mm. to consultants, even they do not look at it uh, mm. from a multidisciplinary approach. So, based on the expertise of uh, the firm or the consortium, the value or the vision is focused in that manner. So, I think. Uh, you know, at some point, we need to reiterate that it has to be a multidisciplinary team that works on a particular project. Secondly, when um, uh, when certain projects that are related to uh, ecological precincts uh, are taken up, it's always looked at it in piecemeal fashion. For example, a river, uh, anything to do with the river is always looked at it, you know, in a particular stretch and not at a watershed level. Even though the scope is in the urban area. Um, be it the authorities or be it the consultants, either or the bureaucracies, the politicians or the uh, consultants refrain or they are really scared of looking uh, beyond the, the, the physicalities of the site, so to say. And at some point, how do we you know, bring in this practice of integrating probably the upper and the uh, lower watersheds if you are dealing in the middle watershed? Or how do you deal if you're doing if you're dealing with the lake? How do you uh, make sure that uh, the catchment area of the lake is also considered? You may not, uh, you know, one may not physically intervene in the catchment area, 
but certain considerations that the catchment data need to be taken into you know for us to design and execute in our area of intervention so what would be that bridge according to you you know be it in a policy be it um, in the governance structure or you know be it in the mindset for you know it could be anything and everything but how would you you know look at streamlining these processes together Yeah. Uh, in a way, like, just like what you just said, uh, you have given the answer also. Uh, first of all, um, now uh, because there has been now integration of quite uh, multidisciplinary as well as the interdisciplinary approaches to design, which has been happening, uh, which is in a way good sign. Uh, so um, the 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 era of specialization, as they say, is now more or less over. Uh, now we are seeing more and more integrated uh, kind of approach, which which need to come into picture, and that's why I was referring to landscape urbanism as an emerging discipline where both disciplines can equally contribute, as far as the uh, the future form is concerned. Uh, as far as uh, let's say our approaches uh, to to designs are uh, are concerned, one is uh, though I am not a landscape architect, so I will again speak from uh, from uh, urban. Uh, design point of view and the kind of politics which generally uh, happens uh, first and foremost thing uh, we don't have data uh, and this is something which we have been uh, you know saying um, quite a uh, time uh, now uh, that is in the sense that uh, you know data is not only about the raw data which is which is there the raw data is definitely not there but even the process of data which has to happen uh, to to become as an information and then finally an information then converted into a knowledge so this data information and knowledge uh, three things uh, we have uh, failed to really uh, generate anything uh, as far as the uh, the study of these three things as well as then delivery to the uh, general public is concerned like i said we don't have a drainage map of a city uh, well done i mean we have marking of uh, water bodies and rivers and there are contour lines and also which becomes a very technical kind of a thing uh, but can we have a, a platform wherein people are able to really relate with uh, how the water in the city actually flows uh, whether it's through animation whether it's through in interesting graphics or cartoons or graphics which can happen uh, there are lots of multiple ways but it has to happen uh, that is something which has been lacking so we don't have data first of all and because we don't have data a uh, lot of other institution and corruptions uh, and corrupt practices then then takes place uh, wherein uh, in the absence of data people are able to you uh, give the proposals and solutions very easily and and can can you know make it go through uh, all the hurdles very quickly uh, because there is no data and every time you know some court case and litigation happens uh, court uh, ask experts to give report uh, Uh, first of all <laughs> this should not happen uh, the, the, the even before the case goes for litigation or any kind of a court uh, proceedings happen uh, the project itself how it get uh, you know fruitalized how it get finalized itself has to go through rigorous uh, checks and networks so somehow on the name of uh, fast development and quicker development uh, we have been passing these uh, you know or ignoring these kinds of checks uh, which we see uh, right from big level project at national level or even the small projects at city level uh, that has been the problem so governance of course is is one important thing and governance from the ecological point of view uh, that is something which is not at all happening uh, we have failed to understand that uh, the primary layer on which the city sits is ecological layer uh, and unless and until that builds into the administrative and governance structure of our cities uh, we are not going to have any solution as far as the uh, the flood problems or the environmental problems in cities are concerned uh, so that layering has to be reversed uh, right now we are placing uh, only urban development and economy as the primary layer on which the ideas of cities are based uh, and, and and we have seen the damage it has done so uh, you know escaping from that is is one uh, step or the second step i will say apart from data so personally i identify and i can relate to these two uh, very big shortcomings uh, the absence and management of data uh, at some point of time it could be discrepancy in data as well uh, but the absence of data uh, and uh, has has been a big problem and the second is the the way ideologically we have been thinking about the place of nature in cities 
uh, or vice versa even to say place of nature in city itself is a wrong kind of idea but but i'm saying it only from the uh, expression of uh, point of view that we have to understand that cities are uh, are actually smaller part of the larger uh, network uh, ideas so so that's something that is something which which has to come these two things which i feel are the primary steps which we should take uh, thank you, sir. Uh, there is another question by Ojasmini Sadhu. Mm -hmm. She is asking, uh, what would be uh, your uh, views on regenerating rivers like Meethi River in case of Mumbai, as it has gone through many changes due to anthropogenic activities and it has become mm -hmm. almost impossible mm -hmm. to go back to its original. Mm -hmm. Right. Big question. <laughs> Big question and, and perhaps has a very uh, difficult solution as well. Um, see cities evolve over the period of time and and so are the natural uh, elements in the cities um last year one of our students did thesis on uh, the Miti river uh, not not the whole river but part of it which which goes through the bandra uh, kulla complex and that area and uh, you know one of the observations is that wherever the river uh, and and uh, part of it was still under the fishermen's uh, communities where the fishing activity was going on uh, they were able to rejuvenate it with the help of uh, ecological uh, ecologically healing kind of a restoration uh, by using less and less uh, engineering means but uh, by using more and more ecological means uh, uh, in order to rejuvenate the river so in part uh, they have been able to do it uh, but uh, as far as the whole rejuvenation is concerned i think uh, we need to take some drastic measures um, uh, if you want to at all reclaim the whole river uh, but like i said uh, many of our cities uh, have come to the point or especially the ecological element on those cities have come to the point of no return uh, sadly uh, one will need uh, a huge humongous exercise uh, one of the direction was shown by uh, the lockdown but definitely that is not the way one can approach and lockdown had its own uh, you know uh, collateral effect on on the other uh, aspects such as social and uh, demographic aspects but uh, the way lockdown had uh, you know uh, had shown us that how uh, nature uh, reverts back and and nature heals itself has been a big lesson so uh, little step backward in terms of uh, how we look at the river in cities and how we should not look at them exploitatively uh, you know only uh, but rather uh, like i said uh, these natural places and natural ecological entities have its own um, reason to exist there uh, it, it i mean there's no point in debating about what is to do, do them with the city uh, they they are there and i think at some point of time we should uh, leave them on their own rather than you know thinking about them or uh, integrating them in our discipline uh, you just have to leave it them and and, and work around it uh, we have to also place of uh, also find a place for a uh, little wilderness in our cities uh, somehow uh, we think that nature in cities is need to be regulated uh, and uh, that regulation is done through channelization that regulation is done through uh, afforestation at some part deforestation at some part in city uh, and these kinds of regulation and haphazard changes uh, are also bringing a uh, lot of damage as far as the urban environment is concerned and ecological environment is concerned uh, within cities so uh, a step backward and and uh, let these ecological precinct existing on their own uh, as as the entity which which is which is able to take care of its own uh, but we as human and uh, anthropo uh, scenically point of, i'm talking from that point of view would like to always place ourselves as uh, you know savior of the world and savior of the ecosystem which is not generally the case uh, and so so this approach again i will say ideological approach to to nature um, as far as our disciplines are concerned, academic disciplines are concerned, we need to take a step back uh, rather than you know too much uh, fiddling with the with the with the ecology and its working. 
but I don't have a direct solution because you know place specific solutions will take its own time and research as how do I address let's say when it goes through the fisherman's community when it goes through uh, areas which are highly polluted uh, typical uh, uh, challenges such as uh, sewage disposal directly into the river um, uh, throwing of garbage and solid waste disposal into the river uh, these are place specific solutions but uh, but, but but you know uh, the, the, the fundamental question is uh, why we have made river into a place where we would like to uh, or or compelled to throw kind of a garbage uh, into the river that itself is a larger ideological question which we need to answer yes sir thank you so much for answering thank you thanks a lot sir uh, is there any other question guys No, I think, yeah, that's all. Looks like it's Sunday. <laughs> Real Sunday. Yeah. Yes, sir. Right. So now we would like to wrap up. So thank you. Thanks a lot, sir, for sharing the beautiful stories of cities thank and you. its urban form, how the cities are have been shaping uh, since ages. And you make us realize that the water ages are very much, very much important for us and how they are playing an important role in creating the cities and making the cities identical. So we need to conserve as much as possible because the water edges, you know, they are creating such an environment to uh, to live in, to, you know, to have such kind of recreational activities and all. So thanks a lot for such an informative session. So uh, yes, thank, you. thank you once again for for inviting. <laughs> and yes, we are here in SP Bhopal, but definitely this interaction always is, is always learning. Yes, yes. So uh, I would uh, like to uh, request all the participants uh, that we are meeting again at 2 p.m. Uh, with the Tarun Nanda's lecture. So uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Sonala, would you like to say something? Yeah, we will uh, reconnect at 2 p.m. Tarun will join us at 2 p.m. So a post lunch. Thank you. Will the link be same? Yeah, would the link be same? Yeah, link will oh, be the same. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank, you thank you, Sonam. Thank you. Thank you, Anubama. Yeah. Thanks a lot, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, welcome to the next session of this uh, workshop. So here we have a very eminent speaker with us, uh, uh, Mr. Tanu Tarun Nanda. Uh, Tarun Nanda is a pioneer, uh, pioneered water body revival in Delhi using uh, constructed and floating wetlands, currently undertaking the largest and toughest lake uh, cleanup revival in Delhi, Hoskhas Lake. His firm was founded in 2010. Uh, he is an engineer from UK and uh, uh, who returned to his roots to help improve infrastructure in India, bringing international engineering expertise, expertise. He has focused on the innovative application of engineering techniques to solve water pollution and infrastructure needs for both private and public projects. So here, uh, welcome uh, Mr. Tarunanda. Now the audience is yours. So, yes. Uh, so, um Huh. I came to India about uh, eight years ago uh, to basically see uh, what I could do to help uh, try and develop the country. And uh, when I got here, I spent the first year sort of traveling around, seeing what all the problems were. And uh, one of the main problems in uh, Delhi and also across India is the fact that uh, sewage isn't treated or uh, the measures that they do take to treat sewage are very poorly implemented and maintained. So um, we st I started looking for solutions to uh, sewage treatment uh, that could benefit uh, individuals as well as the public. So uh, I started with like a farmhouse in Delhi uh, using wetlands, constructed wetlands, uh, all natural, uh, that don't require any electricity or chemicals to work, and uh, made this uh, small wetland so that the farmhouse could recycle its sewage uh, directly on site and then use it in the garden. And uh, I think it was one of the first uh, farmhouses in Delhi to have a treatment plant like this. Um, but you can see in the photo the different stages. Uh, there's primary treatment, then there's secondary treatment, and uh, tertiary treatment, and we review worms, and we've used. Uh, I mean, I'm guessing people have heard all about constructed wetlands and uh, how they work, 
uh, how they rely on the bacteria to treat the sewage, how the plants take up the nitrates and phosphates. Um, because, because of that, you don't need any, uh, you don't need any uh, chemicals or filtration. Sorry, uh, sorry, I just have to take this. So this, this wetland managed uh, to treat the sewage all from 30, uh, 30 residents who were living there and uh, collected it all so they could do it in the garden. And then uh, after doing this, uh, we started tackling more public projects. Um, I don't know if you've ever visited a slum, uh, you'll see that all their sewage basically ends up in the nearest pit and gets filled with garbage. And uh, up until this was in 2014, this, there was pretty much no, nobody was doing anything to fix it. Um, and all the lakes in Delhi were pretty much dirty. And the only thing the government was doing was trying to add chemicals to lakes um, to try and make them better. But uh, those attempts always failed. So we said you should be using water treatment infrastructure um, to actually treat the sewage rather than adding more pollutants to a lake. Um, so we demonstrated here that it's entirely possible to do this. Um, and we made a constructed wetland uh, to treat all the sewage from the nearby slum. And we cleaned all that garbage that you could see on top of that water body. Um, and also had these different stages uh, within the wetland. Um, and basically it, was, it cost less than 10 lakhs uh, to do 90 households. And uh, you can see the difference. All the water hyacinth filled up the pond afterwards. Uh, all the trash was removed. And uh, this system was set up so it didn't need any operational or maintenance uh, to function. And it was also the first time that uh, floating wetlands had been used in Delhi. Um, and uh, we used about, uh, I think, almost 100 here. And uh, this was when they discovered that floating islands need a lot more vandal resistance in India. Uh, so this, this model with the pipes, you must have seen other people doing, but uh, it doesn't last very long. So we've uh, adapted the model to make it more vandal resistant, um, which you can see in the later projects. And this was another farmhouse project uh, where these wetlands can be used uh, to recycle the sewage. This was in Nardpur. And then uh, after that, we went on and did another slum in Delhi. Uh, this is Vasant Bihar. Uh, most people probably don't even know that these kind of places exist um, in these neighborhoods. So you can see it's the same situation where loads of garbage gets collected and the local pit gets filled with sewage. And this here you can see this is where all the sewage flowing. The dark spots are where the sewage is flowing over the garbage uh, and down into the top right into the water body. So um, we didn't have much of a budget for this. So we didn't use any concrete or anything like that. Uh, we just dug these kinds of nalas uh, to channel the flow and split up into different stages uh, so we could incorporate treatment into it. And here you can see this is filling up the knowledge with different uh, media, filter media that uh, uh, break down all the pollutants. And this is just more stages. Uh, you can see the plantation beginning. And this is the adapted uh, floating island model that's much more vandal resistant. Uh, and almost indestructible. Uh, Housecast Lake, we further developed the model and tested it with the LATI and made sure that it's totally indestructible. Um, but these ones are also very Randall resistant and look better than just the plain pipe ones. So this is uh, the islands after one month and this is them after two months. So you can see how much the plants grow and you can even see a uh, reduced algae on the surface of the lake. Uh, because essentially these are, they, all the plants sit on a floating platform, their roots go into the water and they take up all the nitrates and phosphates. Um, it's like a hydroponics example. And this was after another few months. Uh, you can see how much they grow. 
uh, and they grow very quickly, even over the winter in Delhi. And um, so when you're traveling around India, you'll often find uh, locations that need some quick treatment or uh, when the authorities have no idea what to do. So uh, it's very easy to just have a quick event where you, uh, because one of the advantages of floating islands is that anybody can make them and you can use, you know, raw materials that you have at hand. So this was Goa, so there was lots of uh, coconut fiber and uh, bamboo about, lots of plastic bottles. So um, we just put together these quick, uh, quick examples of what floating islands could be and got some uh, local people involved and they made the islands and put them out. Uh, so uh, now this is uh, House Cast Lake. Uh, if you've ever visited it before, three years ago, you'd see this sort of uh, vast waves of algae on the surface and the smell used to be like uh, rotting eggs. So this was at its worst. Uh, this is what the lakes you sort of used to look like. And this was what it looked like after we managed to build the inlet filter and stop the DDA from adding chemicals to the lake. So you can see, uh, yeah, the water quality was greatly improved, even though it was still green. It, uh, you know, there was much less algae on the surface. Uh, so the existing, uh, we, because we were doing it as a, a citizen project, we had to be quite smart with the funding. So we took uh, two existing channels that were there. This board, um, but all the initial work for this was done by volunteers and using waste material. Uh, this is us and some of the volunteers cleaning it all out. Uh, you can see how much garbage and floating sludge used to come into the lake. Uh, so this is the volunteers helping. This was all the uh, rubbish that was left at the bottom. And this was it, like pretty much uh, a few months after we'd done the plantation and finished filling it up. And uh, here you can see actually the water quality uh, top samples are if, when the sewage is coming in. And you can see how it removes basically all the suspended and floating particles uh, because huge amounts of uh, sludge used to come in, floating sludge. And that now essentially gets trapped inside the wetland. And uh, on the bottom one, you can see what happens because we had the option to also pass the lake water through the filter. Uh, you can see how much it reduces the algae in the water uh, just in that one wetland there. So um, this is the sludge that gets all deposited uh, in the wetland um, because it's actually sludge isn't captured in the water sampling. So um, that's why the wetland has had such a dramatic effect on the water quality, is because it's trapped all the sludge that's come in. Um, but the water still needed further treatment, which is why we took this other channel. Uh, it was basically a stormwater channel. And we also filled that all up with filter media and uh, planted that as a wetland. And this, uh, we pump water from the lake, feed it through this, and then put it back into the lake. And these are some of the floating islands we first started with. Uh, these were all adopted by members of the public, schools, uh, corporates, uh, people like that. And uh, we've done this to basically supplement the water treatment and provide also bird habitat. And it's also good for the fishes. And uh, they essentially just sit on the lake and so clean up all the nutrients. Although given the size of the lake, we need about a thousand at least uh, to sort of make a real difference. And this is the completely indestructible version that I was talking about. Um, these you can hit with a lati, throw stones at it, and they're not going to break. And also, part of the work we did there was uh, to make a, a, slow, a floating solar generator. And it's actually the first example in Delhi of uh, something like that. Uh, why more people aren't making floating solar aerators and putting them on lakes in Delhi, I don't know. They always seem to put these fountains uh, that only really aerate the surface but aren't very effective at getting oxygen into the depths of the lake. Um, so this was something we did just using the barrels that were lying around the lake and uh, hooking up the solar panels and the air pump. And uh, this, this way there's also no ongoing electricity costs. 
and also um, because uh, sewage isn't the only source of pollution in the lake, in the lake, and especially in Delhi and urban areas, uh, people come and dump all their food waste. Uh, they feed the birds, and uh, it causes a lot of pollution for the lake. And of course, in Delhi, nobody wants to listen. So uh, we found we actually had to walk around the lake constantly. We had to use a GoPro to film people uh, to get them to behave. Because otherwise, as soon as you tell somebody not to do something, they go into a big rage and want to keep doing it. So, um, yeah, if you want to stop people polluting, the, the great way to do it is to wear a GoPro because they behave much better when they know they're being filmed. Uh, so we also, um, in what's different to the authorities, because the authorities only ever tend to vote uh, one value for a lake, uh, lake water quality, and they only tend to give it one value for the whole year. But in uh, reality, the water quality in a lake changes during the course of the day, changes in the week, changes in the month, and also changes seasonally. So really, it has to be monitored on a constant basis. And uh, it needs to be monitored. When you have a lake the size of house cows, which is 15, 17 acres, then uh, you need to monitor in different parts of the lake because uh, uh, you can just see from the samples we've taken uh, how the water quality varies just within the lake. And um, what the EDA contractors used to do was basically pick the best place in the lake and say, this is the effect the chemicals are having. It helps, it helps, when in reality, it's making other parts of the lake worse. So um, we've had to uh, improve the monitoring regime of the DDA and uh, insist that they take samples at multiple locations in the lake. Um, so th this is sort of demonstrating to the authorities what they need to do. And hopefully, in other locations in Delhi, they follow suit and improve them monitoring regime. So that's pretty much covers all the projects we've done. Um, I don't know if there's any questions. We can go go through them now. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Tarun, for sharing such an insightful and uh, hands-on experience of restoration. Uh, so can you also share which plants are more effective or uh, as compared to others in extraction, phyto extraction? I request if uh, the participants have any questions, they can ask or write in the chat box. Uh, hi, Tarun. This is Richa from SPA Bhopal. Hi, hi, Richa. Can you hear me? Uh, uh, all right. You? So, Tarun, so, Tarun, what I wanted to ask was, uh, you, you, have been, you have been working in Delhi, and that, that's a very uh, highly populated area, and it's a dense urban setting. And you have been trying to take up all these water bodies. And so what do you think is a major cause, uh, or what do you think are the major effluents, or I don't know, ne what is the nature of pollutants that is uh, found in water? Uh, so, I mean, it all depends where you are. Uh, I mean, if you're in central Delhi, it's mostly residential sewage. And if you're in industrial areas, then it gets uh, contaminated with industrial waste also. So, uh, so uh, I mean, this is a very innovative technique of using floating islands and, you know, using the roots of these plants to absorb these pollutants. So do you think there is a difference? Uh, I mean, is, is there an efficiency quotient to all these things? I mean, how much time does it take to absorb what kind of pollutants story? Uh, so, I mean, a uh, constructed wetland is just like any uh, STP, like sewage treatment plant, um, as long as it's... It 
it's uh, like the main advantage is that the operation and maintenance is almost zero. And that was the main problem here was that people weren't running the STPs properly. And uh, they basically release untreated sewage uh, into the Yamanar and places like this. So that's why we started using constructed wetlands because they're, they're nearly foolproof. And uh, you don't really need anybody to operate or maintain them. And they continue to function uh, regardless of what, of what happens. Uh, I guess we lost you somewhere in between. Uh, uh, I guess, um, so what I wanted to actually know about is that, is there an equation of how much water can be then taken care of or be, uh, you're able to clean it with what amount of uh, mm -hmm. uh, these wetlands, in, I mean, I mean floating for, islands? Uh, for constructed wetlands, there's uh, formulas. And uh, that you can pretty much treat any volume to any standard. I mean, you can produce drinking water quality um, with the if it's correctly sized. Uh, floating wetlands, there's no real formula. You do it based on the percentage of the how much water body you want to cover and how bad the pollution is. Um, but I wouldn't recommend floating islands just alone. It should always be done with constructed wetlands, or you should always treat the incoming water as well as putting the floating islands. Right, right, right. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, uh, Tarun, so we have some other questions. So Neha is asking, um, like, uh, uh, what type of materials or what type of design do you require for floating wetlands? Uh, so you can see the, the first uh, project we shared with those PPC files. Uh, there we use the PVC pipes and uh, plastic bottles uh, to provide the flotation. And uh, that seems to be the model that the people are following. Uh, and I've seen some people use thermocol, but I wouldn't recommend that because that uh, ends up polluting the water body, tends to fall apart, and the birds uh, kind of destroy it. Uh, so you should be looking for long-lasting materials uh, that will withstand all the vandalism, especially in Delhi, that they're going to undergo. So the next question is by Gargi. What is the lifespan of these floating islands? And can they be introduced in flow, flowing water bodies or rivers? Uh, how they can be. Uh, I wouldn't recommend using that pipe design in flowing rivers because uh, they can get damaged. But uh, it basically depends on what material you use. If you use bamboo, it won't last a few years. If you use uh, hard-wearing plastic, they have last 10, 20 years. Uh, and you might only have to ever replant them. Um, they, they last a, lo a long time. Another question, Taru, uh, Tarun by Neha again is uh, can fruits and vegetable be grown within that and uh, like what type of plant material is advisable in uh, for for plant palette and uh, where can like what are there any published sources which which one can refer to for uh, like we know there is taro or uh, colocasias that work very well in absorption what are the other plants and is there a study that shares this is the extraction potential of that particular uh, plant on how can one access that? Uh, I've seen lists of plants that can be used for specific uh, pollutants. Um, but I haven't, uh, I haven't seen any study that looks at how much it does. Um, but you basically use wetland plants. Uh, Vegetables, I don't know if whether you'd want to eat vegetables grown in a dirty water body, but uh, oh, this, the same technique uh, can be used to grow vegetables, but you'd want it to be done in uh, at least relatively clean water. Um, but essentially, it's all wetland plants or plants that can withstand having their roots flooded uh, permanently. So um, we tend to use locally available uh, native plants from the local water bodies and transplant them into the island. 
uh, there is the same question by Ojasni and Isha. They are asking, could you please elaborate on the species of plant which can use in the floating islands? Uh, so we used, uh, I think in those ones, we used the umbrella palm and the reeds. Uh, and I think that that was all the ones we used in, in those projects. And the calocasia, you think you can also see in those islands. Um, it's all sort of standard, standard wetland plants. Okay, okay. Uh, any other question, uh, guys? Is there any other question? Chatter also another question from my end. Uh, uh, there are so many manuals which are present for constructed water wetland, uh, sorry, constructed wetland design. Which one would you recommend or have worked very well in Indian scenario? Uh, so actually, we've been doing it so long and before there were any standards. So uh, we don't actually follow the government standards uh, when it comes to wetland design because we do like we do things completely differently to the way the government does. So uh, we use vertical flow wetlands. We use different modules. Uh, we use settlement ponds. We use earthworms, uh, horizontal flow wetlands. So um, like the government guides I've seen, they tend to be pretty basic. And they're designed so that a contractor can follow them. Um, uh, the best the best way to learn is to start small, uh, do your own projects, and see how the things you design perform. Um, because these government models, I don't find them uh, like I've also seen government models for biodigesters, and uh, they make no sense really. Tend to cost more, uh, so I wouldn't recommend following the government standards. Um, but if you want to learn, there's lots of uh, like at least internationally, there's the American guide. Uh, there was also a guide like 10 years ago from England, I think, in Germany. Uh, I've, never really even, I've had a brief look mm -hmm. at Indian standards. And there's also an Indian guide to reviving water bodies, I think. But um, yeah, I mean, as I'm aware, the authorities haven't revived any water bodies yet. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure what their guide is based on. Okay, yeah, that is much helpful. Yeah, that way. we definitely need to work on it and see and understand that can be the best guide. Yeah, uh, so but the best is uh, engineering, engineering books on uh, wastewater treatment. Yeah, uh, because they would teach you the biology and chemistry and uh, all the rates of reaction you need to know. Um, because wastewater treatment is actually quite complicated. You need to know about nitrates, uh, nitrogen, uh, and how they all interplay phosphates. Um, and once you have that knowledge, then you can start designing wetlands uh, that function properly, rather than using these kind of standard models where they say one square meter per person. Because, uh, I mean, that's just that's just like a thumb rule that's given to people so that they can also do it. but. Uh, our installation doesn't apply at all. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's sewage treatment in England is really only done by civil and environmental engineers, whereas in India, everybody's doing wastewater treatment or you know wants to build these things, but it's actually quite complicated. And yeah, the first place to start is to understand the chemistry and biology, and uh, start with the engineering textbook about wastewater treatment. So if there's a, if we have a like as much as the number of inlets that are feeding the water bodies, we can go for as many constructed wetlands. The cleaner, the better. Uh, yeah, the, the, the yeah the, you want to treat the sewage coming into it uh, as much as possible. Yeah. And uh, it's quite easy to do that if there's an existing nala. At least you don't have to spend on the excavation and uh, concrete costs. Yeah, very useful, efficient, and maybe it can go a long way in reviving and restoring Indian uh, water bodies. So, a uh, very uh, insightful presentation, uh, Tarun, and thank you. And I would also like to thank Professor Raval, who recommended 
and uh, your lecture and he's also present over here so um, so okay. yeah hi sir so hello everyone hello sir uh tarun ji thank you so much for giving your insights it was in in half one of the in half uh, uh webinars that i have heard you for the first time <laughs> and uh, and i'm i'm involved with certain few other projects uh, here uh, which might begin some day and uh, at that time maybe i will contact you and it is a uh, having like you having been in the us for uh, for many years <clears throat> i feel very frustrated here that uh, these things are taking so long and people like you and few others in maharashtra yeah, you might have heard of oikos the organization o i k o s uh, they, they are ketki and mansi they are two ladies who have been practicing ecological restoration uh, what that is uh, and there is a society for ecological restoration in in pune also so these are the few these are the few lamps uh, that we we need to connect ourselves and we need to learn from each other and perhaps if there is no manual available right now we need to create that manual uh, and uh, so that the younger people who are listening to this kind of webinars uh can learn from it and they can get encouraged to do their own little thing it doesn't have to be the entire stream or nala that you might want to do it but one recommendation that i do have if possible and it is not always possible is to start at the beginning of the nala as as close to beginning of the nala so that you do not have to do so much downstream uh downstream like we may not get projects which are starting from the beginning of the first order or second order or third order stream but those the even in a given length or a tributary if you start further uphill further where it begins or where where at least the large amount of pollutants do enter the stream uh you the closer to it that you begin the less kind of effort you will need to put at the downstream level and downstream levels are also more more deep wider and they are more costly to intervene in so uh the nala that you talked about in delhi are little bit of different nature uh but yes many lessons can be learned from this different kind of case studies and i'm so glad that uh, uh you are here for this uh, particular webinar thank you thank you for having me Uh, thank you sir uh, for your uh, amazing words so uh, this is uh, it and uh, 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 sonal ma'am uh, yeah. uh, would you like to say something about the uh, about the next session for the tomorrow yeah so uh, so to, this is the last say, lecture of the workshop and uh, from tomorrow on uh, tomorrow early morning we will have the presentations or discussions on what has emerged out of group works so 10 am uh, that will be starting so they we have uh, chronologically group 1 to group 7 and each of the groups will be given uh, 12 minutes time to share uh, what what is their idea of riparian restoration in their given projects and uh, we'll request uh, professor ravel and uh, we have also invited other experts for the uh, to share their thoughts on the outcomes and how it can be improvised further so i think the two lectures which have happened today by vadvika sir and by tarun can uh, further uh, reinforce our idea of uh, treating uh, using uh, stream or like uh, bio engineering using bio engineering for cleaning and reviving our water bodies and they also have given a clear picture how it can happen on ground or how it can look like on ground uh, so tarun ji will again uh, might be asking you sir if there are any uh, the things so we will be sharing your email id so it, our participants can connect you directly so uh, the okay okay yeah thank you so much again and i'll be uh, sharing the detail uh, of the validatory program for tomorrow so in the first half we have the 
group discussions and in the second half we have the validatory program or certificate distribution so uh, and i'll be emailing you all for that so thank you and we can close our day for today ma'am before we close our day uh, i would just like to inform all the participants that uh, this workshop uh, wouldn't have been possible without all of you and uh, it is uh, of utmost importance that uh, even though we are working at a seed level right now and we would want to take this ahead but that will not happen until unless we get a feedback from you and if there is any suggestion so we'll be sharing a google form with all the participants and maybe they can revert us uh, uh, by today by today evening and they can let us know how we can improvise and how we can work ahead so thank you let's let's close for today and you will get it five days have been like a festival to us like every day we were quite eager to meet our so many participants and tomorrow will be the culmination day and uh, we thought it would have been like very hectic but it was such a pleasant journey with uh, such a many participants and we came to uh, learn so many things from them as well and our students have also taking their benefits of these multidisciplinary and uh, different age group teams so thank you all again and um, we'll uh, i share you the detail program of the validity tomorrow so thank you tarun thank you sir